بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وذكر في الكتاب مريم إذ انتبذت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هي ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا صدق الله العظيم Brothers and sisters in Islam Alhamdulillah, we've been discussing the past few weeks the great women of Islam and the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to women in this religion and in this deen. And just for as a clarification, the purpose of this is not to just mention random stories about women being mentioned in the Quran because women are mentioned in the Bible also. But the, the focus of this discussion is to which exclusivity Allah is mentioning women in the Quran. That is the main thing. That Allah Ta'ala mentions women in the Quran as great personalities. They're not just random people. They're not just being mentioned because if you look at just random mentioning of women, women are mentioned in the Bible also. Women are mentioned in the Torah also. But the main focus that I want everybody to understand and take into consider is the exclusivity the speciality, the status that Allah grants women in the Qur'an is not like any other book. And for us to understand that just like males can be heroes, and they can be champions, and they can be very great devoted slaves and servants of Allah, similarly women have that status equally as men do. And if there's any doubt about that, imagine that what book dedicates an entire chapter to Maryam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. What book? Imagine the Bible itself, it doesn't have a, a, a single, it has a cha chapter about Matthew, Luke, John, Paul, whatever, right? But it doesn't have a single chapter that says the chapter of Mary, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. There's no, in the Quran there is the status that is given, that not just making mention of them. It's not just a random mention, that extreme exclusivity that they are one of the greatest personalities, not only great personalities, champions, people to be followed, people to be revered. And we are completing the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, alayhi salam, that what are the lessons from the life of this hero? Subhanallah, that such a woman, such a woman that she is a leader for men. Such a woman that she can be a leader for men. And a lot of times, you know, I, I would ask this question, you know, young kids or young boys, if you ask them, you know, who's your hero, who's your champion, who, nobody will say, you know, Maryam alayhi salam. But I tell you, Wallahi, after studying the story and giving these lectures about these women, Wallahi, these women are my heroes. These women are heroes. These women are amazing women. That the concept that we have generally is that men are heroes. Men are leaders. Men are people who are worthy to be followed and worthy to be taken as an example. But when you read the lives of these individuals and these personalities, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, just as He has given that spiritual strength and that st the spiritual ability, right, to struggle for the sake of Allah. The spiritual ability, that internal strength, it is... Yes, women, as far as the external strength is concerned, they might be weaker than men. But when we read the stories of these women, we know that in internal strength, in spiritual strength and in power that Allah has instilled within them internally, Allah Ta'ala has given them such strength that, that some of them can even encompass and overpower men in their spiritual strength and spirituality. And from, from amongst those 
uh, women, just to recap and uh, reiterate what I had mentioned in the previous lecture, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned in one hadith, he said that خَيْرُ نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ أَرْبَعُ That the greatest women, champions, females, that were the greatest women of all of time, the greatest women of all time, they were four. The greatest women of all time were four. Number one, Maryam bint Imran. Maryam Mary, the daughter of Imran. Number two, wa Asiya tumra'atu Fir'aun. Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Pharaoh, everybody knows Pharaoh, the one who persecuted, right, the people Musa alayhi salam and the people of Musa alayhi salam. But the wife of, right, the wife of this Fir'aun, he was a, she was a woman of very great status. She was a woman of great piety. And she was a woman of great struggle for the sake of Allah. And Khadija to bint Khuwailid. And Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid. The wife, the first wife of our beloved Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Fatima to bint Muhammad. And Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. So these are the four great women of Islam. There's many. There's many of them. But I want to emphasize specifically on these four that they are, right, the greatest women of all time. And in mentioning this, another purpose is, brothers and sisters, Take these people as your heroes. Take these people as your examples. The people that are heroes nowadays, they're not worthy to be heroes. The people that, take, that, that we take as role models, or the youth are taking as role models, they're not role models, they're supermodels. You gotta make up your mind what you are. Are you a, are you a supermodel? You're a role model. And I say the same thing to the sisters and to the mothers. You gotta make up your mind. Are you a supermodel or are you a role model? Right? You're working on your face and on your clothes more than you're working on your character. You're working on your face and you're working on your clothes and your external more than you're working on your internal heart and that condition. That is what your children need to see. That is what your children need to see. You need to dedicate your time and you need to dedicate yourself to them. And that's wonderful. If a woman wants to look good, she can look good for her husband, not for anybody else. Somebody asked me this question, can a Muslim girl go to a prom if she's dressed properly? Dressed properly for who? Do you know what a prom is? Culturally, I don't know from, what your, from your background, but from my background, you know, prom was the night that, you know, it's not even appropriate to mention. I don't even want to mention it. Prom night, what's prom night? If you look at it from a guy's perspective, prom night is like the night that you, you know, uh, have a great date. I don't want to go further than that. I don't want to go further than that. For a Muslim woman, subhanAllah, we're going to read the story of Maryam. The, 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 the chastity, the piety, to be in such a gathering where such things are, which is set up so people can have these type of relations and people can, this is not acceptable in Islam. Premarital relations is not acceptable in Islam in any way, shape or form. So this is something for us to take into consideration, something for us to understand. And the reality of the matter is, is that at this, in the same breath I say, that if a person has that desire, there's a substitute in this deen. Islam has not told you to harness, right, hold back your natural inclinations and your natural desires. Every single human being, by Allah, you've been instilled with certain inclinations, sexual inclinations, inclinations of hunger, inclinations of sexual desire. This is all something which is normal. But that doesn't mean that you do it according to the way of, you know, whoever. There's an Islamic way of going about that. There's an Islamic uh, method of going about that. If a man, if a girl likes a guy, right? You don't go out with the person in the prom and then take them out and test drive them. And after test driving, I like this car very much and I want to buy it now. There is no test driving in Islam. You like somebody, there's nothing wrong with having feelings for somebody. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there's nothing more beneficial than two people who love each other than marriage. So you have feelings for somebody, you have love for somebody. Go through with that in an Islamic manner. There's nikah, there's marriage. And the Islamic marriage is a very simple ceremony. It takes five, ten minutes, not longer than that. I can get you guys married in five, ten minutes, not anything longer than that. It's very easy. Why did Allah Ta'ala make marriage easy? So that fornication can become difficult. Now it's the opposite. Marriage has become difficult and fornication is very easy. If you want to fornicate, it's very simple. Go to the prom. 
am I am I am I joking or am I does everybody agree with what I'm saying or am I saying something wrong? Everybody knows what it's about. I don't need to, you know, it, yes, there's, a, there's another aspect to it. I agree, there's this popular, popularity type of thing, reputation type of thing. But when a person is devoted to Allah, when you are a Muslim, you don't care about what people think about you. If it's that, how, how is that appropriate for a girl in hijab to be at the prom? It just doesn't even look right. It doesn't even look right. A guy wearing his nice, you know, brand new turban, you know, wearing his jubba, <laughs> going at this... Best pal, his buddy, two guys are going to the prom together. <laughs> what are you thinking? Come on. Does that even, does that even sound right? Doesn't even, it doesn't even fit. doesn't even sound right. Don't want to give anybody any ideas. Hey, that's a good idea. Wear my nice whitest turban. Wear my nice white jubba and go to the prom. No, please. So this is just something that everything has a place. Everything has a place. The fact that a woman wears hijab doesn't mean now that you take that hijab in places that are inappropriate. Hijab is not a license to just now do whatever you want to do. Hey, there's, a, there's a haya, there's a shame. It's, hijab is much more than a scarf you wear on your head. Hijab is much more than a scarf you wear on your head. It's, it's, it's a shame in the heart. It's a shame of, 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 in, in a modesty. And just the story of Maryam that we're going to see, subhanAllah, she was a symbol of modesty and shame. She was a symbol of, of, of piety and chastity. She was a symbol of goodness and purity. And everybody, any man who wants to marry a woman, no matter how bad that person was, but when he wants to get married, when he wants a wife, when he wants a mother for his children, he doesn't want somebody who has been with somebody else. Is that true? That's true for every. So how can you expect that from her, but not be that yourself? I ask this of all my brothers in deen, all my brothers in Islam, that when you get married, every single one of you expect that your wife be very pure, your wife be very chaste, that she should not have had any relations with any man before, true or false. But you yourself, that's not a condition that you have put upon yourself. That is great oppression. That is a great deception. That you expect that from her, but you don't expect that from yourself. And understand this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, That the pure men for the pure women, and the pure women for the pure men. And the evil women for the evil men, and the evil men for the evil women. You want a pure woman, you have to be pure yourself. You want to be, have a righteous and a chaste woman, you have to be righteous and chaste yourself. You want to do whatever you want to do and then expect that you're going to have a pure and pious wife? That's, that's, not, that's not fair. That's deceiving yourself. And usually the way it happens, what goes around comes around. The way you are, that's the same type of wife that you're going to get. The same way that you are, Allah Ta'ala will give you a wife just like that. One of our teachers, may Allah bless him, he said something, he gave me very beautiful advice. He said, I said, Shaykh, give me some good advice. How can I get, find a good wife? He said, you be a good man and you'll find a good wife. You be a good person and a good human being, work on yourself, don't be bad. Fill in this gap right here, move on. Move a little bit. You rectify your own character, you better your own self, you keep yourself chaste, and Allah will give you somebody that's chaste. You keep yourself righteous and Allah will give you somebody that's righteous. You, you keep yourself pious, Allah will give you somebody who's pious. So this is an advice that I give to all the young brothers and sisters. If they were to have any desire or any uh, inclination, then understand that first and foremost, that you have to keep yourself chaste. This is something which is very, very rare nowadays in this day and age. For a person to guard their virginity, for a person to guard their chastity, it's something laughed at. It's something joked about. Right? Premarital relations is something, if a person is trying to guard themselves, they think that there's something wrong with that person. That person has some sickness. That person has some, you know, defect. That person is not defected. That person has that spiritual purity and that innocence. The removal of that innocence, that is the disease. The disease is not for a person to be chaste. People don't even know what chaste means anymore. 
It's not even in the vocabulary of the society anymore for a person to be chaste. Tell a person what's pious. People don't know what's pious. People don't know chastity. These words that I'm using, people don't know what it means. The youth don't know what it means. Chastity means guarding your virginity, guarding your private parts from illicit sexual intercourse. This is honorable in the sight of God. This is very honorable and very respected in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't feel ashamed of this. My sisters or my brothers, this is not something to be ashamed of. And we as parents, we should encourage marriage. Why not? Why can't you give them a corner of the room? That room that they have, why, why can't you give them that room? Marry them off and give them their room. Why do they have to have a, you know, $300,000 $300, house for them to, 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 to be married and have family? Let them, give them that opportunity. Sometimes as parents and immigrant parents, we don't know. This is not Afghanistan. This is not Pakistan. This is not India. Have you gone to the schools? Have you seen how it is? Have you seen the situation? We should make it easy for them and not make it difficult for them. And alhamdulillah, certain parents are coming to their senses. But the reality of the matter is what I'm trying to focus on is this chastity. This is something very, very great. And it mentions that that person who has the opportunity to commit a sin, that man or woman, that guy or that girl that has the opportunity to commit that act of fornication, but he guards himself for the sake of Allah, what will, what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him shade under the throne on the day of judgment. It mentions that on the day of judgment, there will be no shade. The sun will be drawn near to the heads on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. And people will, def people will be in the intense heat of the sun. And there will be no shade except the, sh the, the, the shade of Allah's throne. And one of the groups of people that will be given place under that shade is that young man or woman that guarded their chastity. They had the opportunity to commit that sin. They had the opportunity to commit that adultery or that fornication. But they did not. They guarded themselves for the sake of Allah. Allah will make them VIP. VIP, very Islamic person on that day. Very Islamic person. He'll be very honored on that day. So this is not something small. And we see an example of that chastity in Maryam, who had guarded herself. Right? And Allah Ta'ala, when, when, when Allah speaks about Maryam, one of the things that He speaks about is, right? He says, Ahsanat farjaha fanafakhna fihi min ruhina. She was somebody who guarded her chastity. She kept her virginity. She is honored with the title of the Virgin Mary. She is honored with that. Nobody says it out of disrespect. We say the Virgin Mary out of honor. This is how we revere her. This is how we honor her. And she is worthy of reverence and honor. But she is the mother of Jesus. She is not the mother of God. She is the mother of Isa alayhi salam. This is how she is honored. The Virgin Mary, when she guarded herself and she guarded her chastity and devoted herself to Allah, فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا we blown the spirit from us, which was the spirit of Isa alayhi salam. We blown that spirit into her. And then she conceived of Isa alayhi salam. So the story goes, we were mentioning that she was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels had come and told her that we give you glad tidings, that you will bear a son. And that son will be, right, a proof of the great power of Allah, that how Allah can create how Allah can create without the intermediary of a man. So Allah mentions the story so beautifully. And these verses that I'm going to read to you, these are those verses that the king of Abyssinia accepted Islam because of these verses. When we, king, when we think about Christians, we think about Roman emperors, blue eyes and blonde hair. One of the greatest Christian emperors was an African black, the king of Abyssinia. The Hab he was a Habashi. The king of Abyssinia, his name was, the, the, the title of those people was the Najashi, the Negus in the English language, N-E-G-U-S. And the most, some of the most orthodox Christians till this day, they live in Ethiopia. They're not blue eyes and blonde hair. They're some of the most orthodox, original Christians from the time of the early period of Jesus. They are in, in, in Ethiopia. And the king of Ethiopia in the time of the Prophet Muhammad accepted Islam. How did he accept Islam when he heard these verses that I'm going to read to you? 
these verses when he heard them. He is a Christian. Not only is he a Christian, he is a Christian ruler. He's the ruler of his land. He's the emperor. He's the king. He's the head honcho, whatever you want to call him. He's the boss. Right? The boss don't change his ways so easily. It's a great loss, right? It's a great defect. It's a great aib, a deficiency for a king to change a religion. It's not something so easy. There were two Christian kings, two Christian empires in the time of the Prophet. One was the Byzantine Empire, who was Heraclius. We know about Heraclius, his story. Herakl in the Arabic, Heraclius in the English or the, the, the Latin. And the second Christian king was the African king, the, the, the Negus, right? Najashi. One of them, he knew that Islam was the truth. He knew that Islam was the truth and he tested his people, but he did not accept Islam. When he saw what his people were, that the reaction of his people, when he mentioned it to them, he then changed his, he, he changed his mind. He, 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 he did not proclaim his Islam. But the Najashi, who was the other Christian king living in the time of the Prophet, he, procla he proclaimed his religion. He said, I accept the, the faith of the last Prophet who came, Muhammad. This Prophet has been foretold in the Bible. This Prophet has been foretold in the Torah. I believe in that last and final messenger. So just to mention the story of Heraclius, what he did when he heard the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he heard that, he said that this is that Prophet that is going to come. He asked a couple of questions, right? He asked a couple of questions. He said, does any of his forefathers have kingdom that he wants to become a king? He said, none of his forefathers were kings. Okay, he said, is his, is his followers increasing or decreasing? He said, no, his followers are increasing. He said, do the people that follow him, are they more the poor people or the rich people and the nobles? He said, no, they're all the poor people and the slaves. So this is who has asking? The Christian ruler of Byzantine. He's asking all of these questions because he knows the signs. Why is he asking these questions? Because these signs have been mentioned in the Injil, in the, in the Gospel. Then he asked, he said, who's winning the wars? Your battles that you have amongst each other, who's winning them? He said, sometimes he wins and sometimes we win. He said, then he asked a couple of other questions. Then finally he said that, what does he teach? He said, yeah, he teaches that, you know, uh, love thy neighbor and, and, and join family ties and don't tell lies and believe in God and don't worship anyone besides him. He says, he says, what's the problem? Why do you guys have so much problem with this person? What is he telling? He's not, he's, not, he's not calling to something false. He said, yes, but he curses our idols. He's telling us to renounce our gods and our statues and our idols. And he's telling us to believe in one God. How can we do that? All our commerce and our trade and our business is going to go downhill. So then Heraclius heard all of this. And he said, this is exactly the signs of the final prophet that is going to come. He said, I, I, can't, I can't help you, I'm sorry. Because they wanted, the, the, the Arab idolaters, they wanted the uh, Christian empire to come and crush these people. He didn't, they didn't get any help. He said, no, I'm, not, I'm not messing with this guy. I'm not going to mess with this person, Muhammad, because he looks to me like he's a prophet. You people look like the troublemakers. I'd rather not deal with this. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't want to be involved. So he said, and then after that, Heraclius knew in his heart that he was the truth. So he wanted to test his people. So he said, I want to test these people. So he gathered everybody. He said, oh, my people, what do you say if I were to follow the religion of this man, the final prophet that came, Muhammad and his way? He is calling us to the truth. This is what Esau had promised and so on and so forth. All of the people, like you guys are sitting in front of me, Everybody, imagine, gets up and starts running to the doors. Imagine if I tell you something and everybody just starts getting up and not only getting up, everybody starts running to the other direction. But he had the doors closed from the other side. He told the guards, close the doors from the other side. I want to see how my people react if I tell them that I'm going to accept Islam. All of them got up. All of them started running to the end of the, uh, to the, end of the, uh, uh, to the hall. And the doors were locked. And they were saying, open a door. Our king has become a heretic. Our king has left the religion. So then what happens? He said, oh, very good, my people. He just realized. Very, very good. I was just testing your faith. Now I know you're strong in your faith. 
I was just seeing what you're going to say. Now that I know that you're true Christians. Very good. And then he decided that if I'm going to do this, and if I'm going to go through with this, then they're going to abandon me. And out of fear for his kingdom and fear for his power, Heraclius remained in his religion even though that he knew what, that, that Islam was the truth. But Najashi, when these verses were recited to him, and these verses that I'm about to read to you, he knew that this was the truth and he accepted the truth. So Allah mentions in the Quran, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ That mentioned to them, O Muhammad sallallahu mentioned to them in this book about Mary. إِذِنْ تَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا That she, she went away from her, from her family to an easterly area, away from when her time in the monthly period would come, she would go out at a distance, away from people, out of shame and modesty. And because they didn't have like bathhouses and these type of things in those days, she would go and the women would go and take their bath out somewhere very far where nobody could see them. فَاتَّقَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا So she placed a curtain. Not only did she go somewhere far away, she placed a curtain in a place where she's completely isolated and nobody can see her, washing herself. فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا So he sent the angel Gabriel to her, Jibreel alayhi salam. فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّا And he didn't come in the form of an angel. Because... The form, if the angel takes its original form, that the form of an angel and its original is so awesome that a person cannot, cannot withstand the sight of an angel. What do people, what do people think an angel looks like? A blonde, a blonde haired lady with wings? That's Hollywood angels, okay? Blonde lady with wings or a naked little baby with a, you know, flying around with wings. That's Hollywood angels. Angels that's mentioned the angels as mentioned in the hadith and the tradition of the Prophet, they are so awesome and colossal that the Prophet said, I saw the angel Gabriel and he was so colossal that from the east to the west, I could see the angel Gabriel, huge, with 300 wings, 300 wings. This was Jibreel alayhi salam. Wasn't a blonde lady with wings, okay? I don't have anything against blonde ladies. I'm just saying, it's not an angel. It's not an angel. So, so he didn't come in his original form. Because he didn't want to put fear inside of her heart. He came in the form of what? Form of a human being. As soon as she saw a man, and... Brothers and sisters, look at the modesty of this woman. Right? As soon as she saw this man, قَالَ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَنِ مِنْكَ When she was in that state, where she was not covered properly, and she was a woman who was of extreme modesty and shame and chastity and piety, what did she say? I seek refuge in the most merciful from you. Don't come near me. I seek protection in Allah. Don't come near me. She said, oh, hi. Come in, please. I seek refuge in Allah from you. Don't come near me. Who are you? Don't come near. Who are you? You're a man. Don't come near me. I'm not in, a, in an appropriate way. I'm not in appropriate clothing. I'm not in an appropriate state for you to come close. In kunta taqiyya. Do you have any fear? Qala innama ana rasulu rabbik. She, uh, Jibreel said, I am not a man. I am a messenger from your Lord. That I should bestow upon you a very pure child that is going to be given to you. How can I have a child? And no human being has ever touched me. How can this happen? What are you saying? And I am not a shameless woman. I don't have this evil, I don't have these evil ways. I do not have any relationship with anybody. How can this happen? Said, this is how it's going to happen, oh Mary. And this is very easy for your Lord. This is not something which is difficult for him. We are going to make this a sign for all of mankind till the day of judgment. The, the miraculous birth, this is the miraculous birth of Isa, Jesus mentioned in the Quran. 
So what, what the Arabs, they tried to do when they went to the kings, they said, these Muslims, they talk bad about Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. So he said, really? You speak bad about Jesus? And they started reading these verses. And he started reading these verses and not only do you not speak bad about, you speak good, you speak better than even many of, uh, of the sources that we have mentioned, we have heard. This miraculous, the miraculous birth of Jesus will be a sign for mankind till the day of judgment. And what is that sign? Allah created Adam without a father and without a mother. Allah created Adam without male, without female. Allah subhanahu wa created Eve from the left side, from the left rib of Adam without any female. So Allah created Adam with no female, no male. Allah subhanahu wa created Eve, Hawa, with, from a male. No female intermediary. And Allah Ta'ala created the camel of Salih alayhi salam. From no male, from no female. It came out of the rock. Allah Ta'ala brought this as a miracle. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created Jesus without the intermediary of a male, only from a female. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wanted to manifest this sign of His power to, to Him, to, to mankind. وَرَحْمَةً minna, And this is a mercy upon mankind. وَكَانَ amra maqdiya, And this is a matter which has already been decreed. Now after this happened, imagine a girl and a young woman so chaste as Mary. She's hearing this. She said, now if people see that I'm pregnant, they're going to have doubts about me. They're going to accuse me. And she was so overwhelmed by this. You can imagine how much she was saddened by this, grieved by this, that what am I going to do? But she knew that this was the command of Allah. She knew that this was the decree of Allah. So it mentions... Right? When she was ready to give birth, she went to a far off place away from the people. When she started to get the pangs of childbirth, she went to under a tree, which is a date palm tree, and she laid there. She laid there to give birth, and she started to say, She says, Oh, if only I would die before this would happen. And if only I would be forgotten and nobody would even know who I am. How can I face people with this shame? And this is showing the sign, right? This is teaching us, brothers and sisters, that for women at one time, their chastity, their honor and their dignity and their womanhood was something which was greater to them than life. It was more honorable to them than life itself. That for a woman to be accused of an illicit relationship, for a woman to be accused of adultery or fornication, this was worse for her than death. Here, Maryam is saying that, oh no, I'm giving birth, people are going to accuse me, they're going to blame me, and I'm a pure woman. I'd rather die before this. And I'd rather not even be known amongst mankind. This is the value of chastity. And in, in this day and age, it's become so cheap. It's become so cheap in this day and age that a woman... And this is freedom of women, right? That a woman is, is, is used. Nowadays, a woman is used to sell a toothpick, a tire of a car, right? To sell a, 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 a magazine, to sell anything. Women are used because they know that sex sells, right? So put a really nice, attractive woman on the cover and it'll sell. A packet of cigarettes. Is that the price that you put on women? Packet of cigarettes? Is that what she's worth? That a person is going to see that beautiful woman, right? And say, wow, you know, that beautiful woman, that cigarette really goes together. I want to buy that. Is this the value of women? This is not the value of women in this deen. The value of women in the chastity is given such an honor that it is not in any way, shape or form permissible that a woman should be used for something so cheap as this. So she says... If only I would die before this and I would be forgotten. Right? She heard a voice that said, Don't grieve. Allah has, has specially made for you a river that's flowing. So there was a spring that was flowing near her. And shake this date palm tree. Just shake it a little bit and the dates will fall from you so that you can eat from that. There was a spring of water that Allah made for her. 
right? And there was a tree. I mean, you have to go and climb the tree and get the dates, but Allah made it so easy that this was also a miracle, that all she needed to do is just shake it a little bit and the dates would fall by the permission of Allah for her to eat. And Allah Ta'ala told her, right? فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنًا Eat and drink from this and be contented. Don't worry. فَإِمَّا تَرَيِنَّ مِنَ الْبَشَرِ أَحَدًا And if you see anybody from amongst mankind, from amongst Bashar, right? فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ سَوْمًا Then if anybody comes and tries to say anything to you, then just make an indication that I am fasting. I am fasting. And the fasting of the people of the past is that they would not eat or drink and they would not speak at all either. That was the fasting of the people of before. They wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink, and they wouldn't speak either. So tell them that I am fasting. I cannot speak. And this is a, when, when this is a beautiful example and this is that those sisters of ours, that when they submit themselves for the sake of Allah, and they submit themselves to the decree of Allah, Allah has commanded for a woman to wear hijab. There's no difference of opinion about this. No matter whatever people say, for a woman to cover herself, and to wear the scarf, and to wear the hijab, this is something which is the command. It's part of this deen. Every Muslim woman has to do that. And this is the command of Allah Ta'ala. And a woman, when she submits, there's a great lesson in the story of Maryam for, for us, especially for the sisters, that when you submit yourself to Allah, then put your trust in Allah. Don't worry about the fact that, oh, what, what are people going to say about me now? If I start wearing the hijab, if I start covering myself, what are people going to say? People are going to put me down. People are going to make fun of me. You know? And also, right? Look at the trust that she had. If anyone says anything, I am not going to speak to anybody for amongst mankind. Allah Ta'ala, I am fasting. I have no, nothing to say. فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُ And she put her trust in Allah and she's carrying this baby, carrying this child. Imagine a girl who grew up in the most purest environment and she grew up with chastity and piety and righteousness and she comes with this child in front of the people and these people are super like, you know, they're ready to accuse and ready to put allegations on you. So she's coming with this child in front of the whole tribe and in front of the whole people. And what did they say to her? They said, Ya Maryam, لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْءً فَرِيَّةً You've come with a very great sin. What did you do? Ya Ukhta Harun, O oh, sister of Harun. She had a brother who was Harun, a very pious person. He said, Oh, your, your brother is Harun. He's such a pious person. مَا كَانَ أَبُوكَمْ رَأَسَوْئِنْ Your father was not an evil man. That you ended up like this. You're going and you're doing stuff like this and now you're coming with this baby. وَمَا كَانَتْ أُمُّكِ بَغِيَّةً And neither was your woman a bad... Was your, your, your mother a bad woman? Why are you coming out like this? How did this happen? So then, فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ She put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what all the sisters, when you put your trust in Allah and you want to obey His commandment and fulfill His decree, don't fear anybody in the commandment of Allah. Put your trust in Him and Allah ta'ala will make... Allah will make miracles happen. You will see that those people that are your enemies, Allah will satisfy them. And Allah will make them, Allah will silence them. Just like for Maryam, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. So what she do? فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ She pointed to, to her child. So they said, قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيَّةِ How will we speak to a child that is a newborn child? A newborn child, you think a newborn child can speak? Are you crazy? Then at that moment, Isa alayhi salam, Allah wanted to manifest this miracle. So Jesus spoke from the cradle. And what did he say? Inni Abdullah, I am a slave of Allah. Atani al kitab, Allah has given me the book. Waja'alani nabiyan, and Allah has made me a prophet. Waja'alani mubarakan aynama kunt, and Allah has made me blessed wherever I go. Wherever I go, I will be blessed. Wa awsani bis salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya, and my Lord has admonished me that I pray and I give charity as long as I am alive. This is the teachings of Jesus. From the, from the cradle he spoke. Right. And I will be very dutiful to my mother. And I will not be disobedient. And I will not be wretched to my mother. Disrespectful to my mother. Subhanallah. Imagine, this is a child speaking from the cradle. That from the cradle, 
your parents have right upon you that you should not be disobedient to them. Imagine this. From the cradle, Jesus is speaking. And what is he saying? That this is the message. That do not be undutiful and disrespectful to your parents. From the get-go, this is something which has been instilled in Isa alayhi salam. That when he, the first things that he spoke, one is the worship of Allah. After the worship of Allah alone, with no partners, after that is to be dutiful to your parents. Imagine. He's giving them da'wah. Jesus was a newborn child. He's saying, okay, talk, tell me about religion. What is religion about? What is God about? He says, I am the slave of Allah. I am not the son of God. I am slave of Allah. I am the slave of God, number one. Number two, Allah has commanded me to pray and give charity. Pray for myself and give charity and concern to my brothers and sisters in this world. Not only be concerned about myself, but be concerned about others. And on top of that, what am I supposed to do? To be dutiful to my parents. This is the teachings of Islam now, and this was the teachings of Islam before. This is the teachings of Islam. The teachings are one. The foundation is one. People altered it, and people deviated, but the teachings are one. This is what Jesus spoke, coming out of the womb of the mother, he's speaking this. What is this? This is the teachings of Islam. From the womb of the mother, he was speaking this. And this is what we believe. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبَعَثُ حَيَّ And peace will be upon me, the day that I was born, and the day that I will die, and the day that I will be resurrected on the day of judgment. ذَلِكَ إِيسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ قَوْلَ الْحَقِّ الَّذِي فِيهِ يَمْتَرُونَ This is Jesus the son of Mary. Right? This is the Jesus the son, this is the true word. All the other things that you hear about him, being God, being the son of God, he is a slave of God. This is what he said himself, that I am the slave of God. He is a prophet of God. This is that truth which you are in doubt about. مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَ وَلَدٍ وَلَدٍ It is not appropriate and befitting for God to take a son. Begetting sons. This is begetting is an animalistic quality. That's why Muslims don't believe this. The begetting. Animals beget. Dogs and cats beget. How can God also beget? This begetting. And Allah mentions in the Quran, مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ أَتَّخِذَ مِنْ وَلَدٍ It is not befitting and appropriate for Allah to beget a son. Subhanahu, pure and glorified is God. Glorified is God that, that He should have a son. إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا And if it's difficult for you to understand this, just look at the power of God. Why was it difficult? إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا When He has a decree, He just says, be and it is. Just like he said to Adam. So if, if Jesus was the son of God, then Adam is also the son of God, more so. If Jesus, he was the son of God because he was born without a father, then Adam was born be, 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 without a father and without a son, without a uh, mother. Jesus was born without a father and without a mother. He has more right to be the son of God. Isn't it? They say, okay, Jesus is the son of God. Why? Because he was born without a father. He was born without the intermediary of a father. So God is his father. God is the father of everyone in the sense of he is our caretaker. He is our rub. He was our sustainer. In that sense, yes. For God to be the sustainer, yes. He is that. But not that he begot. Begetting? This is not the quality of, of, of Godhood. This is the quality of animals and beasts. It's a very simple matter for him. He just says, be and it is. Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'budu. And O Christians, and O idolaters, or whoever you may be, our Lord is the Almighty. He is the one Lord. We worship Him and you worship Him. That is the Lord that we believe in. And that is what Islam is. Fa'budu, worship Him alone. Don't worship anybody else. Hada sirat mustaqeem. This is the straight path. This is Islam. After that, what happened? After this occurred, then people started to break into different groups and sects. Some of them said, wait a minute, he was born without a father? Okay, he's the son of God. Wait a minute, Mary, she's the mother of God. And this, that, and then all these splinter groups and sects started to come about. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. All these different groups started to come about. It was these verses. It were these verses of Surah Maryam 
that when the Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, he heard it, he accepted Islam. These are those verses. These verses were so powerful that a person who, he, him and his four forefathers were all Christian by faith. But when they heard these verses, they accepted the faith immediately. And, he accepted, and tears were flowing down his eyes when he heard this. The way, the nativity, they call it in, in Christianity, the story of, of Esau's birth, they call it the, the, the way that is mentioned in the Quran is, is amazing. And imagine the struggles that she went through, there is a lesson for all of us. That the struggles that Maryam went through, imagine, she was a single mother. This is one lesson that we learned from her. She was a single mother and she kept herself chaste. Never ever after that did she become married. As certain fabrications have mentioned that she got married and she was, you know, Joseph the carpenter and this, that, and the other. That is a complete fabrication. She, she stayed with, uh, chast and she looked after her son and she made Isa a.s. into the prophet that we know him to be. She looked after that young boy and he became that prophet that we know, Isa a.s. Jesus, who he became, it was through the tarbiyah, through the nurturing, through the teaching of that pious woman. So from this we understand that those pious men, they come from these pious women. If we want pious children, righteous children, we have to be pious mothers and fathers. And this, this story was also mentioned. When the Christians from Najran came, there was Christians in the time of the Prophet. They also came. And they were Arab Christians. And they wanted to know about what Islam is about. So when they came to hear about the Prophet, <coughs> Isa, and to learn about Islam, right? The Prophet read these verses to him and some other verses. And when they heard this, and they said that 60 people, 60 Arab Christians from the city of Najran, and Najran was a city near Medina, all of them were Christian. And then they came and they said, Tell us about Islam and tell us about what you believe about Jesus and tell us about Mary. So he read these verses to them. He read these verses to them that we just read and some other verses. And when they heard this, these verses, he told them that now come and Allah Ta'ala commanded, he, they did something said, do you believe in what I've said? This is the truth. He says, if you now are gonna still argue, Regarding this, then let's do this. And he gave them a challenge. فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ That if any one, of you still want to any one of them still wanted to debate about Jesus being the Son of God or being God or whatever, then tell them this, that let us call our sons and you call your sons. And let us call our women and you call your women. And we get together on an on a, on a, on a open plane. And then we ask Allah, may the curse of Allah descend upon the liar. Are you ready to take this challenge? This is to, to this extent the Prophet called the people to the truth. Are you ready to accept this challenge? Whoever is, the tr whoever is on the truth, let them be guided. And whoever is the one who is the liar, may the curse of Allah descend on them. So when they heard this, the Christians of Najran, and they seen the Prophet coming out with his family. The Prophet's holding Hassan and Hussein, their babies. The Prophet came out of his home and all the Christians of Najran, these 60 people, they're standing outside. And this was the command of Allah. So they still want to argue. They see the clear proof. They still want to argue. So there's no more argument left. We ask Allah to bring the wrath upon us. Whoever is the liar and whoever is not on the straight path, let the curse of Allah. If I'm a liar, let the curse of Allah come on me right now. This is called mubahala. This is what the Prophets would do. This was a challenge. So he came out of his home it was the Prophet Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. And when the Christians of Najran seen these faces, they just said, I, I don't think we want to you know, I don't think we want to do this with these people. I don't think it's really uh, good to call wrath of Allah. When he's seen the nur of, imagine the, the light and the nur and the enlightenment that was descending upon the family of the Prophet at that time. What they would have seen. So when they said, okay, come, let's do this. So what they did, all of them walked back and all of them said, you know, we'd rather not do this. This is a little bit serious. 
It's a little bit too much. I mean, I know religion, but religion's not, you know, that, that much. I mean, you're talking about curse and wrath and all that. That's not all good. You know, we don't want to do that. So they stepped back and they said, we're not going to do mubahala. So they went and they said, okay, I mean, let's, let's, what are we going to do with this guy? We got to have a talk. What are we going to do now? He's done this. You know, we debated him. He answered all our questions. You know, now what do we do? What's the next step? So they're discussing and debating amongst themselves what they need to do. So then the leader of those, the main Amir and the leader of all of them said, Hey, let me tell you guys something. Ya Ma'ashar al-Nasara. Right? He says, Ya Ma'ashar al-Nasara. Qala qa'ilahum huwa al-aqib ba'd al-Masih. He said, look, this is the Prophet that is going to come after the Messiah. Okay? When they went to go talk amongst themselves, one of them was saying like this to them. He said, look, this is that prophet that is promised after the Messiah. You know it and I know it. Okay? You know that Muhammad is a messenger that has been sent. You know he's a prophet. Okay? And he's come with clear proof about Jesus. He told us the reality about Jesus. And you know that if you take the challenge of any prophet, when curses are descending, then none of your elders will remain and none of your children will remain. When the curse starts descending, the children won't remain and the elders won't remain. Just wrath is going to come down. So it's better for us not to deal with this guy like this. Okay? Let's not get involved in this curse calling on each other. We're not going to go very far because we know that he's a prophet. You know that he's a prophet. So we're not going to do that. That's not an option. Okay? And you're going to get rooted out if you do this. So, if you have no choice because you're too used to your old religion, it's very difficult to give up your old religion. Those brothers and sisters that converted to Islam, I congratulate you. May Allah reward you. That is why Allah mentions in the Quran that those Jews and Christians that accept Islam and accept and embrace the light of Islam, when they see it, they will be given two rewards from Allah. Yu'tikum kiflaini min rahmatihi. Those people that are Jews or Christians, and after being Jew or Christian, they accept Islam, Allah will give them double reward. Everything they do is doubled. Your prayer that you pray, your prayers are doubled. The charity that you give, double. The hajj that you do is doubled. Allah. Everything you do is doubled. The question is, but why? It's because you accepted the religion of the one prophet and you accepted the religion of the other prophet. Two prophets, you get double reward. You were not stubborn. You were not stubborn. For that open-heartedness, Allah says you deserve that double reward. May Allah reward them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate. May Allah increase their numbers amongst us. May Allah allow us to value them. They are very valuable people. So he's saying that, look, you guys love your religion. I know you're too used to it. It's hard to go into something new, right? So what? And so therefore, you don't want to give up also that Jesus is the son of God. Okay, I understand that too. But then do what? Just bid farewell to this guy. Don't go and start challenging him because he looks like he knows what he's talking about. So don't challenge this guy with no wrath throwing, curse throwing here and there. Just, right? Just bid farewell to this guy. And go back to your homes and ask him that you're going to be under the, the rule of the Muslims and you'll give tax. You'll give jizya. Right? And ask the Prophet to give you a, 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 a safe, a, a person that will take you safely back to your homes. And here's a very important point to understand here what people say that Muhammad spread Islam with the sword and he just chopped off people's heads and everybody came into Islam. So the question is, why is no heads chopping here? These people openly, they did not accept Islam. They said, we don't want to accept Islam. We'd rather be Christians. So what did the Prophet do? The Prophet said, you're free to go. And I will give you a person that will escort you back so that nobody will harm you. This, this, this mentality that people have, that, you know, Islam spread through the sword. Where is this Islam spread through the sword? This is a clear example that Christians come. They debate. They openly do not accept Islam. They reject Islam. They say, we're not going to accept it. 
We don't believe that Jesus was slave of God or a prophet of God. We believe that he was God or the son of God. We don't want to change. And we don't want to accept your challenge either. So that's fine. Go on your way. No compulsion in religion. But you live under, under the safety of the Islamic rule. You pay jizya. And here is a, 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 an escort that will take you so that nobody can harm you. And who did, he, who did the Prophet give them? The Prophet gave them Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. Aminu hadihi al-ummah. He gave them as an escort Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. And he was one of the, one of the companions that was promised paradise. That's how he honored them. He didn't tell them, oh, you people are losers. You people are fake. You people are this, that. You're going to hell. He didn't say, you people are going to hell. You're going to Jahannam. You're going to burn. What did he say? He said, we have conveyed the truth to you. Those that convey the truth, those that accept the truth, they will be in success. And those that, that, that do not accept it, then they will, they, they will be in failure. They will be in destruction. That's the end of the story. Go your way and know that this is the, this is the, the, the path that it is. And they went. And after that, many of them slowly then accepted Islam after that. These were those verses. These were those verses about Jesus, about Mary, that when the Christians of that time, they heard about it, they accepted Islam. These were those personalities. Isa a.s. mother, Maryam, she was of such a maqam and such a status that she till this day is a symbol of chastity. She is a symbol of piety. She is a symbol not only for the men, not only for the women, right? But for all of mankind, till the day of judgment, she will be an example of piety. And people have a problem with women wearing scarves. Oh, this is such an oppression. Women are covering their head. Oppression? Why do you honor and revere Mary? When, when you, you see in places they make statues of Mary. You ever seen a statue of Mary with a bikini? A'udhu billah. You ever seen a statue of Mary with a miniskirt? Anywhere that you... And, and she is honored for... She is honored by more than billions of people on the face of this earth. The Virgin Mary, just mention that. You go to South America, you go to North America, you go to Europe, you go to anywhere on the face of this earth, you mention the Virgin Mary. Everybody respects her with honor and respect. Is she a naked woman? Is she a licentious woman? Is, she's a, if she, is, she, is she a woman with a miniskirt? Or is she a woman that wears hijab? Have you ever seen a picture of Mary without a hijab? Have you seen a picture of Mary without a covering, without wearing long clothes? Covered from head to toe. Have you seen any? I haven't seen it. They might change it soon. Stay tuned, like they say. You don't know what's next. Every day is changing. Every day there's a new thing that's coming out. There's a new fad. Perhaps you'll find a picture of Mary like that. But I doubt that. Because everybody knows the honor of Mary, what it is. It is her chastity that has given her that honor. It is Allah that has honored her. So sisters and brothers, let's not go in the wrong direction. Let's go back and realize that the honor and the reverence that Allah gave her is to that modesty, to that shame. No place and in no... Uh, for, so it's, it's, it's weird. And, and look at it from a different perspective. Is that when a woman, she covers up as a Muslim, she's oppressed. But when a nun, she's covering up, she's very honorable and respectable. What's the difference between the dress of a nun and the dress of a Muslim woman? Almost exactly the same. The difference is, Muslim women can marry, nuns don't marry. But nuns, they're honorable and respectful. And Muslim women, they're oppressed. Where, where is that? I don't see the logic in that. Those women have chosen that also because of chastity. And there are certain Muslim women that choose not to wear it. It's a choice. It's a choice in Islam also. It's a commandment of Allah, but people make that choice themselves. Just like people make the choice in Christianity. They want to do it, they do it. They don't want to do it, they don't do it. Similarly with women. There's women that don't wear hijab. There's women that don't cover up properly because they've made that choice that we're not going to do it. But the women that make that choice, why are they oppressed? That is their choice. A woman who makes the choice to wear tattoos on her body and be half naked and wear you know, miniskirt and show her body, she's not disrespected. She's not oppressed. She can have freedom to walk around. But a woman who wants to cover her face or cover her body or cover her head, this is something which is going to be against the law. That is also her choice. Why is a woman being held from doing something which is her choice? In the West, people are, are, are oppressed. People aren't even oppressed in, Afga in Afghanistan. Women do, do whatever they want to do. If they wear it, they wear it. If they don't want to wear it, they don't wear it. 
You should see the condition of weddings in Afghanistan, worse than here. They don't wear hijab, they don't care. It's a choice. It's a choice everywhere you go. This, this, this propaganda that gets spread about Islam, that women are forced to do this, where? We know people from our own family. We're Muslim. We know people from our own family. They say, I don't, I don't want to do it. I, I, it's my choice. I don't want to do it. But the question is, is that the one who has taken that choice to struggle and devote herself in this way, shall she, she should not be honored? She's oppressed because she made that choice? That doesn't make sense. So this is a choice of every single woman. And those as, as, as brothers in deen, if your sister, if your mother, if your daughter, if your wife is going to wear the hijab, you should honor her. Respect her. Honor her. Support her. She is going against the tide. She is making the choice to devote herself in this manner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She is not doing something which is wrong. She is doing something which is very honorable. She is doing something which the most revered woman on the face of the earth, Maryam, is doing. Why do you look down upon her? Why do you forbid her? Is it because of the weakness of your own faith? Is it because of the... And sometimes it happens. Certain people, because of the weakness of their own iman, they will not allow their own wives to wear that. To wear the hijab. Because they themselves are ashamed of their Islam. They themselves are ashamed of their faith. But don't let that, don't let that be. Right? Because now this is oppression. You're saying that women are, she's going to be oppressed if she wears it. What, how is that going to be oppression? She made that choice. It's oppression when you're not allowing her to do it. That's oppression. When she's making the choice to wear it, she's making that choice on her own. That's not oppression. When you're going to stop her from wearing it, that is going to be an oppression. And a lot of people are doing this. Young sisters, they want to wear the hijab. But their fathers are not allowing them. Wives want to wear the hijab. Their husbands are not allowing them. And they say it's an oppression. You're the oppressor. You're the one that's not allowing her. This is the true oppression. The oppression is not in this that, you know, she's wearing it. Because it's by her choice. Everywhere that I've seen in this world, people are doing it by choice. I've never seen anybody doing it by force. Eventually a time will come, she'll take it off. I've seen those girls that when they've done it through oppression, eventually they'll leave it. I've seen girls that do that. They wear it because their dad told them or because they put, they've done it by force. But a person eventually will do what they want to do. So understand that this hijab is not a matter, it's a commandment of Allah. But it's like any other commandment of Allah. It's just like prayer. People that want to pray, they pray. People that don't want to pray, they don't pray. Why is it an oppression? It, the hijab is an oppression. So now it's like, you know, it's injected in women's minds. If I do this, I'm going to be oppressed. But who's, who's, who, who's oppressing you? Who's forcing you? Nobody's doing it to you. And eventually those women that end up, if they are oppressed, they end up, they, they end up leaving it after that, after some time. So the reality of this matter is, brothers and sisters, we have to get our facts straight. This is very honorable and it's an, it's an act of chastity. Those of our sisters, those of our mothers, those of our wives that do this, try to understand that she should have her freedom to do this. Because if you're trying to stop her because you think that she's oppressed, she's not oppressed. You will oppress her by stopping her from doing that. You will be the oppressor. She's not oppressed. May Allah Ta'ala give us the understanding. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala give our sisters the strength and the tawfiq and fortify their hearts because this is something which is very difficult. In this day and age, and it's all this Islamophobia that's going around, right? That women who wear this, they're like, there's something wrong with them or something. There's nothing wrong with them, right? Because you'll respect the nun and you'll disrespect the woman in hijab. And that doesn't even make sense. Both of them are choices. In America, people are being forced to wear something. That doesn't even make In France... In America, people are being forced to wear a covering on their head. How does that happen? And how is that that a, a large percentage of people that are accepting Islam is Western women? American women are accepting Islam. So who forced them? Who put the gun to their head? In England, the, a large percentage of the converts that are coming into Islam in England, they're women. So who's oppressing them? Who's telling them to put a hijab on their head? Or the, or the American women that are accepting Islam from here and wearing the hijab, who's oppressing them? I guess they must be oppressing themselves. It's not an oppression. It is, it is they, are following, they are following the true role models. That is the reality.
It is not an oppression. It is the reality that they are following the ro people that are worthy to be role models. Is it good that a person respects you for who you are or a person respects you for your body? For your beauty? For your front and for your backside? For your front side and for your backside and for your beauty? And for your skin? And for your flesh? Is this why a person should be respected? So she's, if this is why a, person is re, why a person should be respected, then there's no difference between her and a car. You respect the car and you like a car because the body looks good. It has a nice, you know, it has a nice polish on it. A nice red Mustang. Looks really beautiful. Is that why you... you so the, the, the same reason you're respecting an object, you're respecting a woman? Is that why, sisters... In Islam, is that why you want to be respected? For your body? Then what's the difference between you and a car? What's the difference between you and an automobile? The respect that women have is in their, in, in their chastity, in their honor, in their dignity, in their piety, in their service to their families, in their service to their, to their husbands, in their service to their mothers and fathers, in their service to their community and their society. But this is not an acceptable co concept that a woman is respected because of her beauty. And this is exactly how it is. Look in the workplace. The most sexual harassment, there's, they say that one out of four women that is in the workplace, she will be sexually harassed. Sexually harassed. And if she wants to go up the, uh, go up the ladder, then let her be more provocative. Dress a little bit more, you know, loose. Dress a little bit more revealing. And she will go up the ladder. This is something, look, read, read, read the statistics. Is this what a woman is to be honored for? Is this what a woman is supposed to climb up the ladder because she looks good? Climb up the ladder because she, she appeals to my lust. Is that what you would want for your mother? Is that what you would want for your sister or your daughter? Remember that the, 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 the commandments that Allah has revealed is in accordance with our, our honor. Allah wants to honor everybody. Just as you would not want your mother, your sister, your daughter to be disrespected in that way. That, you know, show a little bit of body and then we'll see if I give you a raise. You know, you can, you can do a little bit of service to me and then I, 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 you know, I'll let you know if you, know, you can, you know, be... And this, these are the type of things that are happening in the workplace. Why is that happening? Because in this society, respect is not given in that way to women. Respect is given in another way. Models are respected. They're not respected. That's not respect, right? Models are liked by people. They're admired by people. They're not respected by people. A porn star is not respected by people. She's admired by people. That is not the, ad that is not the admiration that Islam wants for women. Islam doesn't want that you admire a woman. That you look at her, that it rouses up your lust that is not when a, and if a woman can't rouse up your lust she is not somebody honorable um, unacceptable that is not that is not acceptable at all that is not what the position of a woman is in this deen in this religion neither in any of the religions that have come let's understand that and we as men we have to we have to change that if you want your 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 wife to be exposed so she can show her body and make herself up so that people can, uh, uh, you know, admire you. Man, his wife is hot. What's the matter with you? Where's your ghayrat? You have any ghayrat? You have any honor? You have any dignity that you want your wife to be made up so other, people, so other men can lust her with, with their eyes? This is something honorable for you? You need to, you need to, you need to check yourself. You need to check, check your heart. We all need to do that. Because if a person has that mentality, your heart is diseased. That you want your wife to go around with you, showing and revealing her body, so that people will admire you. And if she's going to be covered with a hijab, then people are not going to admire you. People will say, oh, look at his wife. She looks like a nun. It's better for you to admire your wife than for Tom, Dick, and Harry to admire your wife. That's much better. That's much, much better for you. That is chastity for you. That is honor and reverence for you. And this is why the youngsters, the young generation, get this out of your mind. Get this out of your mind because when you, when you stay too much and you watch too much and you hear too much, your perspective starts changing. 
You will not want a wife like that. You will not respect a wife like that. You know? May Allah give us the understanding. Sometimes the, the intellect starts going backwards. Those things that are honorable and, 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 and revered, that starts becoming hated. Oh, that's ugly. She wears a hijab. She wears this thing on her head. Thing on her head. SubhanAllah, that she's covered. She is, she is wearing that thing that women have been wearing for thousands of years. This is nothing new. This is, this is not something new that this just came about. She is doing, this is the culture of the, 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 the pious people. This is the culture of religious people and people that believe in God. Even Hindus in India used to cover. Just like Muslims. Even Jews cover. Even Christians cover. This was a matter of chastity. It's not even a matter of religion. This existed in the world thousands of years before the West even existed. So have no shame in your culture and in your religion because it stands for something very, very precious, something very, very honorable and revered. May Allah give us the understanding. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our brothers and sisters, our youngsters, and all our young brothers and sisters, and our old brothers and sisters, all of us, may Allah grant us chastity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that chastity, that piety, that righteousness. May Allah give us the ability and enable us to follow these pious people. May Allah give us the ability and enable us to follow these pious people. Follow in their footsteps. Feel honored to follow in their footsteps and not to feel ashamed in following the footsteps of these pious people. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alayna innaka antat tawwab ar-rahim bi rahmatika ya rahim.